Hello and welcome to my economic and RBI update for March. The key themes this month are another month, another RBA rate hike to talk about. You know, are we entering a period of stubbornly higher inflation or is it just a case of lagging data, which is playing catch up? And finally, how close are we to a rate pause? Okay, let's jump straight into the month's update, starting with the latest data out of the US. Um, we'll start with inflation story first, as this is the driver of all other economic news currently. So what we did learn about inflation in the US was that the consumer price index, the CPI, increased by 0.5 of 1% over January in line with the market, with what market was expecting. This presents an acceleration on the upwardly revised 0.1 increase recorded in December. The CPI grew by 6.4% in annual terms, down from the 6.5% recorded in December. However, that was stronger than the 6.2% the market was expecting, and that was cause for some economic concern. Stripping out energy and food prices, we saw the core CPI increase by 0.4% over the month of January. This was in line with market expectations also. In annual terms, core CPI increased to six, sorry, 5.6%, slightly higher than the 5.5% the market was expecting. Looking into the data further, core goods prices rose 0.1 of 1% over January and increased from the fall of 0.1 of 1% recorded in December. Core services prices increased by 0.5 over the month, slightly down on the 0.6% recorded in the previous month. Core services, excluding house, housing rents, showed a slowing pace of price increases, up by 0.3 of 1% in January, compared to a 0.4% in December. Energy prices increased strongly by 2%, driven by rising gasoline prices and a sharp increase in natural gas prices. The CPI read showed a slowing momentum in goods in disinflation, robust gains in service prices, and a strong increase in energy prices, supporting the story that the Fed will need to lift rates higher to help get inflation down to their target of 2%. Looking at other indicators that the Fed also looks at regarding the inflation story, and we see inflation in the month of Jan January wasn't cooling as much as the Fed and the markets would have liked, as indicated by the PCE and the PPI gauges. The PCE deflator rose 0.6 in January after a rise of 0.2 in December. It was above consensus forecast that centered on an outcome of 0.5. And it led the annual rate to rise 5.4% from 5.3% in the previous month. The core PCE deflator also showed a renewed rise in inflationary pressure. The monthly rate rose by 0.6 versus consensus forecast of 0.4 in December's result of 0.4. The annual core PCE jumped to 4.7% from 4.6% in December. The PPI, which is the producer's price index, which measures factory gate prices, was also stronger than expected in January. The PPI rose by 0.7 in the month of January, above expectations of a 0.4% gain. The prior month was also revised higher to a drop of only 0.2 from the initial reading of a negative 0.5. On a positive note, the annual PPI inflation decelerated for the seventh consecutive month. Producer prices rose by 6% over the year to January. This was below the December outcome of 6.5%, which was revised higher from the initial reading of 6.2. However, the pace of deceleration was not as large as expected, and the January outcome was above expectations of a 5.4% gain. This data read provides some evidence that the disinflationary trend is not moving as quickly as many has it ha had expected. And it also adds weight to the risk of inflation hanging around longer than hoped. And as I mentioned earlier, the Fed will have to act with higher interest rates in the US as a consequence. Let's talk about interest rates now. And we saw that in, in February, 
the Fed hiked the cash rate by 25 basis points. This lifted their benchmark policy rate into the range of 4.5 to 4.75. In his press conference following the decision, Fed Chair Powell noted further tightening was required and that rates will need to remain restrictive for some time. He stated that the disinflationary process had started, but that it was at an early stage and that the labour market remained strong. He indicated that there are likely to be a couple more rate hikes to get to the level that we think is appropriately restrictive. The Fed minutes noted that participants observed that a restrictive policy stance would need to be maintained until incoming data provided confidence that inflation was on a sustained downward path to 2%, which was likely to take some time. The minutes also noted that almost all officials agreed it was appropriate to raise interest rates by 25 basis points at the meeting, while a few favoured a bigger 50 basis points hike. Now let's take a look at some of the other data news out of the US now, starting with the GDP numbers. We saw gross domestic production expand by an annualized 2.7% over the December quarter of 2022. This was slightly below the preliminary estimates of 2.9%. In terms of employment data, we saw the unemployment rate move down to 3.4% in January from 3.5% in December. Now, this is the lowest unemployment rate since 1969 and better than the 3.6% the market was expecting. The number of unemployed people declined by 28,000 to a reading of 5.69 million, and the number of employed increased by 894,000 to 160.1 million. The latest jobs reports comes on the heels of a sharp decline in weekly jobless claims to, to a nine month lows and a larger than expected increase in the level of job openings in December to a five month high, pointing to a still tight labor market. This makes bringing US inflation all that bit harder, you know, down at that bit harder. That said, some commentators noted the surprise result had more to do with the seasonal short-term employment pickup over the Christmas and New Year period um, in, as they expected unemployment to rise from this point forward. Wage growth now and the Fed's preferred measure of wage growth, the Employment Cost Index, the ECI, rose 1% in Q4, down from 1.1% in Q3, and 1.2% in Q2 and 1.4% in Q1. Whilst Q4's outcome is not significantly lower than the previous quarter, it is notable that the growth in the ECI continues to trend lower. Now, the ECI data suggests wages inflation risks are moderating, and that is good news. In terms of moving on to retail sales and consumer spending data, it was a bumper retail sales print for January. It provided another sign of the resilience of the US consumer sector on the back of full employment. Retail sales surged 3% in January, beating expectations for a 2% gain. This was the first positive read in retail spending since October and the largest monthly gain since March of 2021 and follows a 1.1% drop in December. Consumer sentiment, and we see it rose in February to the highest level in a year as near-term inflation expectations retreated from earlier in the month. The University of Michigan's final index of sentiment for the month increased to a reading of 67, the highest since January of 2022, and from a pre preliminary reading of 66.4, but still well off the highest, the highs of the past years, which has reached as high as 100 on occasions. And we also need to note that reading was from early January when things were looking good. We've since had that, that higher inflationary data, which would be con concerning in terms of the consumer sentiment story. Business data now, and we saw the ISM manufacturing PMI edged higher to a reading of 47.7 in February from a 47.4 in January, which was also the lowest since May of 2020 but fell short of expectations of a reading of 48. The reading pointed to a fourth consecutive month of falling factory activity, 
with companies continuing the slow outputs to better match current demands for the first half of 2023. A bigger decline was also seen in production with a reading of a 47.3 compared to expectations of a reading of 48. In summing up the US right now, their economy is actually performing better than many had predicted at this time in the cycle, especially on the jobs front. But this is not what the feds want as strong employment and wages growth continues to bring some added risk to inflation being higher and harder to bring down to their 2% target figure. This means the Fed, as I mentioned earlier, will have to do more heavy lifting in terms of moving their interest rates higher over the coming months. Let's change now and let's talk about China, um, starting with their inflationary story. And we saw the consumer price index rose 2.1 over the year to January, um, accelerating from a 1.8 annual increase in December. The inflationary outcome met ex uh, consensus expectations as the economic recovery gathers momentum and demand heats up. Still, inflation in China remains the envy of other major countries right now. In a sign that this positive inflation story might continue, their producer's price index, the PPI, which measures input price pressures on businesses, declined by more than expected. The PPI declined 0.8 of 1% in annual terms following a 0.7% annual decline in December. January's reading marks the fourth consecutive decline in the annual PPI inflation. This news will also help other countries in terms of reducing the risk of them importing higher prices through imported goods, which is also good news for their own inflation stories in each of those countries as well. Talking interest rates now in China, the current interest rate story looks a bit like this. The People's Bank of China, the PBOC, kept its key lending rates steady for the sixth straight month in, in February, as widely expected. The one-year loan prime rate, the LPR, which is the medium-term lending facility used by corporates and household loans, was left unchanged at a reading of six, sorry, 3.65% while the five-year rate, a reference for mortgages, was maintained at 4.3%. Their GDP numbers, the Chinese economy, uh, showed no growth um, on a seasonally adjusted basis for the three months to December of 2022, compared to market consensus of a 0.8% contraction. And after a 3.9% uh, expansion in the third quarter, uh, and that was all on the back of the COVID lockdowns during the uh, the fourth quarter coming into December of 2022 before they reopened. Now let's sum up some of the other economic activity uh, that's happening through China. And what do we see? On the back of China's reopening, their economic activity swung back, uh, showing growth in January. The official purchases managers index, the PMI, which measures manufacturing activity, rose to 50.1 in January from 47. Uh, in December. Consensus forecasts had predicted the PMI to, to come in at 48. Remember, anything above 50 is actually growth rather than contra contraction. It's expansionary. There was also a decisive rebound in the non-manufacturing activity. The services PMI leapt to 54.4 from a reading of 41.6 in December, again on the back of those lockdowns. Both uh, indexes had previously shown the economy to be in contractory territory since September, so that is definitely positive news. Meanwhile, the official composite PMI, which combined man manufacturing and servicing, rose to 52.9 from a reading of 42.6 in December. Their unemployment rate in China remains unchanged at 5.5% in January from the 5.5% in December of 2022. So in summary, China is getting back into the swing of things after their COVID policy changes, but they do need to focus on domestic consumption. They need to get that firing again um, as the export markets are going to be more challenging for them given the economic slowdown in most Western economies in 2023, there'll be less demands for their exports. Moving over to Europe or the Eurozone now and starting with their inflationary story, we saw inflationary surprised on the downside in January uh, as energy prices fell by more than expected. The consumer price index rose by 8.5% over the year to January. This was lower than the 8.9% result expected by consensus and was down from the 9.2% reading in December. The annual pace of inflation 
has now decelerated for three consecutive months. However, while headline inflation was down, core CPI, a better measure of underlying inflationary pressures, remained around a record high. The core CPI was 5.2% higher over the year to January, matching the record high in their December outcome and was above expectations of a 5.1% reading. The core reading suggests that inflationary pressures remain elevated in the Euro region and like the US, it might take longer for inflation to cool. What did the EC ECB do with when they got that inflationary read in regards to their interest rates? Well, what they did is they raised their interest rates by 50 basis points, taking the benchmark deposit rate to 2.5%. Now, this is the highest rate since the global financial crisis back in 2008, 2009. The ECB's president, Christine Lagarde, uh, implicitly signaled that at least one more rate hike in March was likely but hedged her bets by adding that it isn't irrevocable. This uh, Euro area economy has proven more resilient than expected and risks to growth and inflation are becoming more balanced looking at the, the data coming through, which is the consensus of most economists right now. They've benefited very much from a mild winter um, and hopefully we'll, we'll see them uh, getting through that particular period. In GDP terms, when we were expecting uh, potentially their first round of a negative uh, growth. What we did see in the December quarter, the GDP showed the Eurozone economy grew by just 0.1 of 1%, but it did grow uh, in the last quarter of 2022. The result was better than consensus estimates of that, that contraction that I was talking about of negative 0.1. However, it still represents a, a slowdown from the 0.3 growth in the third quarter. So still some headwinds there. Looking at some of the economic data indicators now of the Eurozone, and we see the unemployment rate was at 6.6% in December. This was unchanged from the November reading, uh, which was revised higher from 6.5 to 6.6%. The outcome was slightly higher than consensus expectations, which centered on an outcome of 6.5 again. High inflation and rising interest rates are impacting households spending on the spending front with retail sales declining by more than expected in December. Sales were 2.7% lower on the month against the expected 2.5% fall. This was the largest monthly decline since April of 2021. However, the, the fall followed a 1.2% gain in the prior month, which was revised up from 0.8% increase. In annual terms, sales were 2.8% down over the year to December. Sales across all subcategories were down by over 2% in a month, including food, non-food, online sales, and automotive. Activity in the service sector was stronger than expected and in expansionary territory, remember above 50 as a reading, for the second consecutive month. The Services Purchasing Managers Index, the PMI, rose to a reading of 53 in February, up from a reading of 50.8 in January. This was above consensus expectations of a reading of 51. The outcome was the strongest since June of 2022, which also recorded the same reading. The strength in the services sector showed that the economy is holding up well under the weight of higher rates. Conversely, activity in the manufacturing sector remained in contractory territory for the eighth consecutive month and was weaker than expected. The manufacturing PMI came in at a reading of 48.5 in February, below expectations of 49.3. This was slightly lower than the January outcome of 48.8. Looking at some of the recent economic confidence data indicators, and we see consumer confidence printed at a negative 19 reading in February, up marginally from the revised reading of negative 20.7 in January. The result met expectation and marks the fifth consecutive monthly improvement in sentiment since a record low of a negative 28.7 in September. Still confidence remains deeply negative by historical standards and comfortably below the long-term average of a negative 10.3. Economic confidence remains in contractory territory for the eighth consecutive month in February at a reading of 99.7. This was despite the milder winter adding to hopes that the region will be able to avoid serious recession. The outcome was below consensus expectation of a reading of 101 and was largely unchanged from the 99.8 result in the prior month. 
Investors' confidence improved in February, but remained in pessimistic territory. Confidence rose from negative 17.5 in January to a negative eight in February. This was above consensus expectations of a negative 13.5. Confidence has improved for four consecutive months since hitting a recent low of negative 38.3 in October. However, it remains pessimistic territory for 12 consecutive months. In summary, in the Eurozones, they're certainly not out of the woods yet. And in terms of avoiding a, a recession, it, they've probably re avoided a serious recession at this point in time, but they still run the risk of going into negative growth territory. Um, they still have to obviously deal with the ongoing war in Ukraine, which looks like it's going to escalate in the coming spring months as the weather gets warmer. And obviously the challenges of higher inflation hanging around for longer. And that seems to be concern for the month in terms of the economic developments that we're seeing in terms of most national central banks. You know, initially they, they were worried about basically really high inflation and not getting it down. Now they're worried about how stubborn inflation could be and how long it might take to get under control. And it's clear that inflation has peaked around the world and is heading down, but it's the pace in which it can be brought under control is still the $64,000 question. And the next couple of months are going to be really telling in terms of what data story is playing out there in terms of just how stubborn the higher inflation will be and then what the, the central bankers around the world need to do in terms of lifting rates. So it, it is quite interesting in terms of getting past the, the main concern of peak inflation they're now thinking about how quickly they can bring inflation under control. All right, so that, that wraps up our, our world tour. Let's head back towards Australia now. And, and in terms of you know, the economic lens of Australia, it's, it's been quite an interesting time for the first couple of months in 2023. Now, we always lead with the RBA board meeting today, no different. And at their board meeting today, the governor and his board followed through on their promise of lifting the cash rate a further 25 basis points to move the cash rate to a reading of 3.6%. Mid last month, there was talk about a possible 50 basis points hike, but the recent data, which I'll be talking about shortly, didn't support such a move. In fact, the data of the past week or so actually supports a pause in rates more so than a larger increase in the cash rate here in Australia. The decision continues the RBA's most aggressive tightening cycle on record and has doubled down on their focus to bring inflation down faster, as opposed to running the risk of inflation becoming entrenched in the economy. Similar story to the fears of other central banks around the world. If it wasn't clear to us before, it's now crystal clear that tackling inflation and higher inflation harder is their number one priority. And their jawboning message has also made it clear that their other stated goal of keeping the economy on an even keel, referring to a soft landing, is now their clear second priority behind uh, going harder on inflation. Their increase today also makes it clear that any increase in the cash rate from this point forward makes the task of keeping the economy on an even keel, i.e. a soft landing, so much harder indeed. So with this news, now's probably a good time to remind everyone about the risk of entrenched or stubborn inflation. What it results in is higher or sustained inflation distorts the economy in a negative way and leads to even higher interest rates and higher unemployment, which in turn impacts livelihoods and standard of living for the masses. So we do need to tame the inflation beast. And although the cash rate is a very blunt instrument to do this work, it is still the best instruments that we have, unfortunately. So where to from the cash rate from here? Well, I know I've been saying since my update in December that the cash rate pause is close. This statement remains more true today than even back then. We are very close. What I got wrong back then was my belief that a soft landing was just as or even more important than bringing inflation down quicker. Because what's happened since is that inflation is showing up on the demand side in both the basket of goods and also the services side. So what we're seeing here in the CPI index is the goods inflation was very high early, but it's now starting to show up in the services side on the demand side of inflation. 
And this is the reason why the RBA are concerned and the reason why they think there's a risk of it taking longer for inflation cycle to play itself out. That's a good segue into exploring the monthly inflation data and what we've learned. The monthly consumer price index indicator rose 7.4% over the year to January, slowing considerably from an 8.4% annual increase in, increase in December. In monthly terms, the CPI declined 0.4, providing our first potential sign that the beginning of disinflation, remember my prediction from last month about that disinflation will be one of the buzzwords of 2023. I still believe this to be true, but it's certainly one of those first signs that disinflation is starting to show up in the Australian economy. However, inflation remains high compared to the target rate of 2 to 3% set by the RBA. We still have some way to go, and the unknown risk is whether inflation remains stubbornly high or it will keep falling from this point forward. So one thing that is clear to me is that like the US and the Eurozone, we are past the inflation cycle peak. So the record books should show that inflation did peak in the December quarter of last year. Now, going deeper into the CPI data, we learn a little bit more. So housing at 9.8%, food at 8.2%, and recreational culture at 10.2%, which includes domestic and international travel, continues to experience the most significant price increases in annual terms. On a clearly positive note, all three categories slowed in the month on an, on an annual terms basis. There was also some positive developments on the goods inflation, with prices for household equipment and clothing and footwear falling sizably in January, pointing to a more significant softening in goods price inflation as the year plays out. Let's talk GDP numbers now in the end of December quarter. And we, you know, they were weaker than most uh, economists had expected. So we did see growth for the quarter was only 0.5 of 1%. And this led to the annual reading of just 2.7%, which was lower than pretty much every economist's forecast. It's clear the economy has reached a turning point. The impact of higher inflation, interest rates starting to take a real hold across the economy. Household disposable income declined and recorded its weakest outcome since September quarter of 2012. Now that's outside the COVID impacts, that is, as income growth has not kept up with higher costs of living. This means that households are reducing their saving buffers to help fund their current expenses. Domestic demand for households, government and businesses came to a halt over the quarter as well. Again, looking at outside of the COVID data, this was the weakest outcome since June quarter of 2014. Growth in the prices of goods and services consumed domestically eased to its lowest quarterly rate since the December quarter of 2021. It's worth also noting that demand from overseas arrivals at a record pace, I might add, is helping hold up aggregate economic activity, meaning the data read would have been even worse if it hadn't been for the spending of these new migrants over this period. GDP per capita was flat over the quarter. However, in aggregate terms, GDP per capita increased by 0.5 of 1%, and the same as the overall December quarter on the back of this higher population growth. Household consumption on a per person basis declined over the quarter without the increase in the population aggregate consum consumption, which accounts for around 55% of the economy, would have also gone backwards. So as I close out the GDP data update, something to ponder. Our positive terms of trade added over 1% to the GDP for the December quarter. So if we strip out that figure, we had a negative GDP quarter for growth. So it's becoming very clear as the Australian consumer is seeing their spending power decline, the domestic, uh, the domestic consumer recession is very much in play here, even if we don't have an overall technical recession in full, DG, in full GDP terms, thanks to our miners and exporters. Now let's take a look at the unemployment story. We saw the unemployment rate increase to 3.7% in January 2023. The number of people employed declined by 12,000 over the month following a revised decline of 20,000 in December. That means the number of people unemployed jumped 22,000 
over January and by around 30,000 people over the last two months. The share of the working age population employed declined by 0.2 of 1%. The share of full-time employment and the participation rate both edged lower and the youth unemployment increased to 7.9% from a reading of 7.7%. This all points towards further declining employment story playing out in 2023. Add to this the acceleration of population growth via higher migration levels, and the employment story is certainly starting to worsen. In fact, in January, there was, 41, 000, there was a 41,000 increase in the working age population. Remember, this also helps in keeping wage increases lower, reducing the risk of any wage price spiral, which is the main catalyst for driving prolonged higher inflation. So we need to remember that. So what's interesting here in the data is that the RBA forecast released only a few weeks ago um, had the unemployment rate at 3.8%. Their forecast was 3.8% in December of this year. So by 2023, they were forecasting the unemployment rate to be at 3.8. So the RBA have either got their forecast wrong or they know something about in, an employment spike coming shortly that hasn't hit the data feeds for us yet because we've got unemployment currently sitting at 3.7. And I can tell you from personal experience in terms of talking to other business owners and, and seeing what's out there that we are seeing job freezes occurring in businesses. We're seeing redundancy in the areas of the property sector, the finance sector, the technology sector. So the, the economic slowdown is real and it's happening now. And we should, we should see this showing up in the, in the data in the next couple of months is my opinion. So looking, uh, looking at this through the RBA's cash rate lens, once again, the unemployment rate moving beyond their forecast so quickly is further reason for a pause in the cash rate. Now, on the back of the unemployment story, let's have a look at the wage story and what it's telling us about that wage price spiral risk the RBA is concerned about. So we did see that the wage price index, the WPI, increased by 0.8 of 1% over the December quarter. This was a slowdown from the 1.1% in the September quarter and was also marginally weaker than the June quarter. In annual terms, the wage price index grew 3.3%. Private sector wages grew by 0.8 to a reading of 3.6% higher in annual terms. The quarterly pace is significantly uh, saw a significant slowdown from the 1.2% in the September quarter. Public sector wages increased by 0.7 of 1%, slightly above the September quarter outcome to be 2.5% higher in annual terms. Now, this data read saw even more pessimistic economic forecasts missing their forecasts as much as pretty much every forecaster had wages growth higher, including the RBA, which forecast a 3.5% rise instead of a 3.3% rise that we saw recorded. So what does all this mean? Well, it's, it's indicating little risk of wages growth blowing out, causing the whole wage price spiral risk that the RBA has been so concerned about. And if the risk of wage price spiral is subsiding, then it passes another hurdle in justifying further rate increases in the current rate cycle. Furthermore, it supports my, my view that we have either arrived at a logical point for a pause, or we are so close with maybe only one more increase away from that pause. Now, I hope that's the case for all mortgage holders out there if I'm right this time. So if the economy is slowing, tick. Unemployment is rising, tick. Wages are contained, tick. Why haven't we seen a pause already? Well, the only data point that still has me not demanding a cash rate pause is the consumer spending story. Now, I've been reminding folks over the last few months that if we keep spending at the levels that we're currently spending, you know, in terms of the pace of spending over the last six to 12 months, the RBA will have no choice but to keep lifting rates higher. So let's take a look at the consumer spending story to see what we learned in the last month or so. Now, looking at the month of January spending in isolation, you might think consumers still aren't getting that message to stop spending with retail trade spending increasing by 1.9% over the month. However, looking at the data, if you take 
into account spending over the last four months up until the end of January, the message is finally starting to land with households, with retail trade spending falling by 0.2 or 1% over that period. And in real dollar terms, that's about $60 million in less spending over the last four months until the end of January. The good news for a rate pause was consumers pulled back on certain discretionary items. So retail trade, excluding food, cafes, restaurants, and takeaway food has fallen 2.1% over the four months to January. This includes spending on department stores and on household goods, clothing, and footwear. The not so good news is we continue to keep our wallets open for cafes, restaurants, takeaway food spending, which increased by 1.7% over the four months to January. Similarly, spending on food grew by 1.4% over the four months. As well, we keep getting out or taking our wallets and getting them out and keep spending big on entertainment, you know, things like concerts, shows and events. So whilst it's clear spending overall is slowing and we had a good time spending over the summer months, because we all had a job, consumer spending hasn't slowed enough for the RBA to have any level of comfort at this point that their tightening is really stopping consumer spending. So I'll take this opportunity to remind everyone, if there's any chance that the cash rate remaining below 4%, spending needs to slow further. And we need to see it slow further and faster um, in the current data, because if it doesn't show up in the data, interest rates will continue to go higher and the cash rate will move above 4%. So now what is interesting about the spending story is that it's, there is a disconnect with consumer confidence and sentiment data compared to consumer spending. So the only thing I can sort of wrap it up to sort of say we're so depressed about what we can see in the future that we're going to, uh, to give ourselves some retail therapy by going to a concert or a show. Um, that seems to be the case or, or maybe even on holidays. So let's look at the data now in terms of consumer confidence and consumer sentiment. We saw consumer sentiment tumble 6.9% in February to a reading of 78.5. This was only marginally above the um, cyclical low of 78 struck back in November of last year. To find a lower reading, you need to go back to the depths of the pandemic or all the way back to the 1990s recession. So what I mean about the disconnect between spending and consumer sentiment, it's, it's true. We, we really are quite pessimistic um, and our sentiment is quite low, but that's not showing up in terms of us stopping our spending our, our money. The rebound in optimism through the summer break has come to an abrupt end. Of course, we have had the fastest rate of inflation in 33 years and the RBA continued to keep raising rates through this particular period. That is why consumer sentiment is the reading that we saw uh, in the last month's data. Going deeper into this data, we learned that household finances relative to a year ago deteriorated sharply. As pressure on household budgets build, adding to a sombre theme, households do not expect a reprieve anytime soon. The time to buy a major household item, sub-index, a proxy for spending intentions, deteriorated considerably to a reading of 78. That's the fourth lowest on record. Similarly, housing market sentiment tumbled to its lowest level since 2008. For context, that's when the RBA cash rate reached 7.25% before the onset of the great financial crisis brought the rates tumbling down. So whilst we're seeing healthy spending levels, we are also reading about major household budget concerns. It's clear there can only be one winner here. Spending is going to fall more sharply in 2023, but not out of want, but rather out of need as discretionary income is swallowed up by higher loan bill repayments. It just needs to happen sooner rather than later, again, if we want to keep the cash rate under 4%. Turning our attention to the business story now, and we saw business confidence spike six points to a reading of plus six in January the first reading above zero since September of last year. On this reading, confidence is now back around long-term running average levels as the reopening of China, the resilience in the US, and to some degree in Europe. From a business perspective, consumers are still spending, uh, which is providing cause for business optimism in January. Now, conditions rose uh, plus five to a reading of plus 18, 
conditions have moderated from the peak of a, of a reading of plus 24 recorded in September, but remains elevated. Strong summer trading conditions underpins the strength. The profitability and unemployment measures also improved and remained elevated. Now, demand appears buoyant despite retail data suggesting that conditions are starting to let up. Capacity utilisation, which measures the extent to which businesses are exhausting their resources, rose to a near record high of 85.7%. Forward orders also picked up, adding to this inflationary cost pressures re-accelerating, pause for effect, re-accelerating in terms of what's happening there. So purchase costs were up 3.2%, labour costs 27 and final production prices up 1.7%. They all rose in quarterly terms after a slowdown in the second half of 2022. With the only good news from an inflationary point of view is that these figures remain below their peaks from the middle of 2022. So that's the business data for this month, but I've got some of my own views to add here. What looks like a good set of business numbers when in fact, from an inflationary and interest perspective, what we want to see business conditions, we want to see them deteriorating in the short term, not actually feeling pretty confident about that. Now, the reason we see that is, firstly, context about the timing of this data read. I need to highlight that the data read was before the RBA went all hawkish on the cash rate again in February, causing the January spike in consumer confidence to fall sharply. As we just talked about, and since then, the stock market had a minor correction after its mini rally in January on the back of the markets, realizing that global inflation had peaked. We are now tracking, you know, we are now tackling the risk of this story of inflation remaining high for longer. And that really has reset our thinking about uh, the challenges in the economy. Secondly, business confidence, um, you know, because consumers are spending, but what we just did talk about earlier is spending power is being removed. And so businesses will start to hurt more and more. And that should see their confidence and their sentiment start to deteriorate sooner rather than later. So therefore, it's my conclusion that there's only a matter of time before that business data starts to worsen. And again, um, you know, given that the data read was before the RBA jawboning exercise in February, I suspect that the latest business confidence and sentiment data has also peaked and that these numbers will deteriorate as such over the months uh, ahead. Time will be my judge on this call. Either way, it's bound to happen sooner rather than later. Um, and when it does happen, it's another tick in the box for a rate pause. So it's really important that we measure all of these sort of measures around what is stopping the RBA from um, making a rate pause. Well, business confidence still remains elevated, spending still remains elevated, but everything else is lining up correctly. Now let's turn our attention to the property market and let's start with uh, the building approval story. So we saw private sector approvals have slumped to their lowest levels since July of 2012. Compared to their peak in March of 2021, private sector approvals have fallen by almost 50%. The number of both houses, negative 13.8% and multi-density approvals, wait for this, negative 40.8% declined over the month of January. Approvals for houses declined across all states and territories, whilst multi-density approvals increased in the mining states of Queensland and Western Australia. Now, we'll be talking about this trend for some time now. Post the home builder boom, um, initial a spike that we saw in 2020, 2021, we're now in a situation where demand for housing is falling off the back of a truck, on the back of rising interest rates, tightening lending cycle, elevated building and labour costs, which I again have been mentioning over that time. Overall, the building approvals, from a building approval standpoint, it's going to get worse before it gets better. And this is going to create a larger undersupply of housing in the next two to three years. In turn, this will help support lower price falls, so lower value price falls from this point forward and support potentially price rises in the near term once inflation and interest rates start to settle down. In terms of housing lending data now, we saw that new housing finance, excluding refinancials, tumbled another 5.3% in January. 
That makes it a run of 12 consecutive monthly declines. This resulted in the value of new housing credit reach has reached its lowest level since August of 2020. Sharp monthly declines were recorded in new lending to both owner occupiers, negative 4.9 and investors, negative 6% alike. The annual fall in new lending in both owner occupier and investment borrowing categories slumped to its largest on record. Following on from this data, I just shared in terms of the building approvals, we are seeing this flow through to an 8.9% fall in new lending for construction of dwellings. New lending for dwelling construction is now over 61% below its February 2021 peak. And that was only two years ago, pointing to, again, that further slowdown in new housing supply. Whilst lending for new dwellings has fallen off a cliff, refinance activity is powering on and remains close to record highs as households shop around for better deals. The refinancing story is set to continue given over 800,000 odd fixed rate loans are set to expire this year. So finally on the lending front for this month, we see first home buyers have continued to be squeezed out of the market as higher interest rates erode borrowing capacity. The number of new loan commitments for first home buyers fell to its lowest level in more than five years in January. So that's approvals. Then we just did obviously lending activity. Now let's have a look at the prices story. And we saw looking at the core logic data for dwelling prices racked up their 10th consecutive fall in February, recording a national decline of only just 0.1 of 1%. Now this is the smallest fall since May of last year, which was when the RBA began increasing the cash rate. Now, interestingly, Sydney bucked the price decline trend with growth in property prices of 0.3 of 1%. Now that's the first lift in the Sydney market for 13 months. Unit prices nationally also ceased declining, recording a flat outcome in February. So what are we saying here? Tight supply, um, still enough demand. And so we're now starting to see the market being met, equilibrium in the market. So we're going to see less of that decline and potentially more areas where prices are going to start moving forward. Pro uh, dwelling prices in other major capital cities continue to fall, but the data suggests the pace of declines is slowing more than likely due to the severe shortage of stock, which I've just mentioned a moment ago, which is also be able to meet the current levels of demand. The national decline in dwelling prices from the peak in April last year is now just 9.1%. Now, this is the deepest since before the 1980s, but still less than 10%, which is surprising given the steep interest, that steep rate increases we've been experiencing. In terms of price falls, generally speaking, we still haven't found the bottom of the market. And in my opinion, we are going to get, we are getting closer by the month, even closer by the day in some markets, as we just saw when we were talking about the Sydney market. Now, if rates keep going higher, it's obviously really clear that, uh, that property prices will still have downward pressure on them. But it just goes to show you that we're getting very, very close to the bottom of the market. So let's run through those capital city results now for the end of February. And we saw Sydney was, as I mentioned earlier, positive plus 0.3 of 1%. Melbourne was negative 0.4. Brisbane was negative 0.4. Adelaide was negative 0.2. Perth was negative 0.1. Hobart was negative 1.4. Darwin was negative 0.3. Canberra was negative 0.5. And we saw that, so the combined capital cities overall was negative 0.1 because Sydney is makes up the vast majority of the weighted index there. And then combined regional areas were negative 0.3 of 1% for the month as well. So that led to a national reading of negative 0.1 for the month of February. So uh, when we talk about property prices, uh, are slowing in the correction uh, pr pretty much due to the supply constraints and people getting on with what they get on with. Um, if the cash rate continues to go higher, will that re-accelerate? That's a question um, that remains unanswered. Um, and depending on how high inflation holds, that's also another question in terms of 
um, you know, basically how much momentum and how much equilibrium in price balance we can see during that time. So uh, time will play that story out for us. Now, looking now at the rents and we see uh, rents continue uh, to, you know, their record rise and will continue this trend throughout the course of 2023, given the severe shortage also in rental accommodation across Australia currently. We saw the RB, RB, uh, sorry, the ABS data reported that the average rents across Australia increased by almost 5% in the year to January 2023. Newly advertised capital city rents increased by 11.6% in annual terms to the end of February. And that's the highest since records began in the early 2000s when it comes to advertised asking rents. Let's run through quickly the typical rent yields that we're seeing across the country. Um, so CoreLogic has Canberra at 4.1% typical rental yield, Darwin at 6.3%, Hobart at 4.4%, Perth at 4.8%, Adelaide at 4%, Brisbane at 4.3%, Melbourne at 4. Point, uh, sorry, Brisbane at 4.3%, uh, Melbourne, my, my apologies, at 3.4%, and Sydney at 32 Now, eventually, higher rents will entice investors to return to the market, and we do expect that to start happening towards the end of this year in some pockets. Um, you know, with only uh, maybe one more rate rise, maybe two, but then we will see a pause. Um, that pent up demand is really going to start to show itself. Um, and then again, we're going to see what's, what's going to happen with those property prices, but we may be very close to the bottom when it comes to that. So that wraps up the property data story for the month. And it also leads to the actual wrap up of my economic and RBA update for the month of March. Now, there are some key takeaways that I want us to be thinking about. I want us to be thinking about this slowing spending. It still remains the key to an interest rate pause because softer demand reduces prices and that reduces demands for business, which reduces employment, which reduces wage price growth pressures, which reduces inflation and slows the economy overall, which in turn reduces the interest rate story. So, Again, you see how those pieces are lining up. It's a lot to say in one thing, in one phase, but it's really, really true. You've got to understand that all of these things sequentially will start to take shape. So the only thing that's not lining up at the moment is consumer spending. So if we keep taking those prices that businesses are offering us, um, then we potentially keep running the risk of having higher inflation for longer. Now, in terms of that, that's what I also want to be talking about. The RBA is putting the brakes on. Uh, they continue to keep, keep increasing uh, interest rates at this time, um, and that is obviously going to reduce households' ability to spend even further, and that is intentional. That is the RBA's intention. Now, they've told us that the safety of landing the plane safely or keeping us on an even keel is their secondary priority now, their main priority is to make sure that inflation doesn't hang around. So that means that we're getting these last lot of interest rate rises before we get to a pause. But if and when we get to that pause, I want to talk about that as my final message. And what does this mean in terms of a perspective timing to buy property? Well, we do know when a pause does come, there is underlying demand that sits there. Now, when is the best time to buy property? The best time to buy property is when you can afford to hold it for the long term. I've always said that that will remain my number one message to anyone who's looking to buy property. Uh, you need to buy property in the short and longer term in terms of you need to be able to hold it for the long term. So that's the number one time to buy. But the second most important time to buy property is when others are fearful, okay? And when effectively the, the worst of the conditions are finally being realized, that's when the smart money acts. And I can give you a perfect example of that. So during the COVID period, what we did see is when everyone else was fearful and they sold out of the stock market and some people sold properties because everything was going to be dire, outside the other side of that, the smart money went into the market. The smart money says, we're not going to be able to pick the bottom. That is true. Uh, but what we are going to be able to do is, well, most of the bottom is coming. You can see the softer landing is coming in terms of property prices. So there is definitely an argument to say that some of the smart money moving now um, could uh, beat the, the bottom of the market in terms of get the full uplift if property prices go on the other side. Now, you are definitely asking a barber whether they need a haircut, but I can tell you that where the smart money does live um, is in terms of 
finding opportunities in the market. We've seen the Sydney market actually grow for the month. Now, again, it's uncertain what's going to happen in the future, but what is certain is the trend is showing us that, you know, that the correction in property prices is slowing. If the cash rate has to keep going harder and higher, that correction may re-accelerate. There is a risk of that. But on the other side of it is that we're very close to the bottom. And if we do get to that bottom piece, those people who are, who are making smart decision purchases now have done that without lots of demand, lots of competition, and they're going to enjoy the spoils because once the cash rate does pause and once interest rates start coming down, we will see a re-acceleration in terms of property price growth over that time. So that's just a, a food for thought message as I close out this March economic and RBI update. So just remember, knowledge is empowering, but only if you act on it. Bye for now, and we'll see you next month.